Hello everyone and welcome to the Ann Arbor District Library's AADL TV YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in for tonight's discussion of Passion for Peonies, celebrating the culture and conservation of Nichols Arboretum's beloved flower. In just a moment, Scott Hamm of the University of Michigan Press will introduce tonight's speakers. If you enjoy this program, don't forget to click like down below and follow our channel for more AADL programming. For players of the Ann Arbor District Library's summer game, enter the code herbaceous for 100 points. And now let us begin learning about peonies. My name is Scott Hamm and I'm an editor at the University of Michigan Press who worked with David Missioner and Bob Gracie on Passion for Peonies, our new book. David Missioner is, has curated the peony garden at the University of Michigan's Nichols Arboretum since 1990. He's the co-author with Carol Adaman of Peony, the best varieties for your garden. Bob Gracie is Theodore Roosevelt Chair of Ecosystem Management in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan, as well as the Director of the Mathine Botanical Garden and Nichols Arboretum. When the three of us started discussing this book project nearly two years ago, I envisioned it as a sort of a short profile of the Peony Garden at Nichols Arboretum, which I knew would be celebrating its centennial in 2022. It quickly became clear that for Bob and David, the Nichols Peony Garden was actually just an entry point for the book to explore the rich history and culture of Peony Garden that has particularly deep roots here in the Midwest. I hope that we could start our conversation there. Bob and David, what was your motivation for creating this book and how do you think it turned out? Well, Scott, a lot like you said, I think that our initial motivation was, was something that would commemorate the, the Peony Garden um, on the advent of its 100th anniversary. But um, you know, as we thought about it, we, we knew there was this rich history of peonies, particularly here in the Midwest, that we, we wanted to uh, celebrate. And so um, we uh, you know, clearly had stories that um, had been some older, older um, uh, writings about peonies that we thought would be important to share as well as uh, stories about a lot of the breeders that were involved in, in shaping the cultivars of peonies. And then also one of the key themes in our garden is about the uh, conservation of, of historic varieties. And so we invited some writers to uh, do chapters in the book about that. And then um, fortunately last year, we, we spent time uh, photographing our garden intensively, and that allowed us with the rich array of photographs that we have throughout the book. I had similar motives with the interest in the book, and one of them is as a curator and as with Bob, deep interest in archives, it's important to capture an important moment as a reference point, and our centennial is a hinge point in the trajectory of the Peony Garden <clears throat> as a living museum. And so what we wanted to capture was this whole cascade of scale of the importance of individual cultivars and their conservation, the collective group that's at the, Botan at the Arboretum and how beloved it is in the community, as well as the bigger issue of the social context in which peonies were developed and once you open that door, you're into the interactions of European and Asian cultures spanning centuries. And we wanted to get a really good grasp of it in a way that was also accessible to everyone. I know that you both have loved peonies for much of your life, but I, I wonder, were there any surprises when you were researching the book that you didn't know about kind of the history and culture of peonies? I, I I don't think at least I didn't realize that 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 there were many different levels of peony breeders. Those that were really professional and ran nurseries, and then a lot of people doing it in their backyards. Um, I mean, I knew that peonies were commonly shared in families. That that oftentimes people would would move peonies with them, inherit them from their grandparents, and um, take them along. But um, I also hadn't really thought about um, peonies as being, um, you know, blooming in June here in the Midwest and being associated with graduations and weddings and, you know, the deep meaning that that brings to a lot of people about peonies in their lives. 
I knew a bit about peonies, mostly from their legacy roles as traditional medicines, one species in particular in European history, although it, in the history it's confused how many species the one is. And I had no real construct of the depth of enthusiasm and breeding of peonies in the Great Lakes region and the Midwest from before the American Civil War right on through the current years. Um, we are one of the great centers of peony cultivar development um, in, a, in cultural history of peonies when one looks at it across the centuries. I had no clue. Speaking of that, David, um, I was consistently struck as we worked on this book about the important role that the Midwest has really had in the history of peony garden. Is there something about this region that makes it particularly well suited for growing peonies? Surprisingly, there is, even though there are no peonies native to this part of North America. The wild peonies in Asia, Eastern Asia, and across Europe are all in areas where deep well-draining clay soils are found, and it's always an area with a cold winter. And so you've just described much of Michigan. <laughs> and so this is a particularly good climate for them. It, it is very uh, similar to where they evolved in nature. It's just that they never got here. So that's why they thrive so well for us. Yeah, people have always talked about peonies thriving wherever lilacs uh, grow well as well. And so that's another beloved flower that is throughout the Midwest as well. And oftentimes you see the two plants in a lot of people's gardens. And our book actually also highlights other important peony collections in Michigan, as well as in neighboring states and provinces. Uh, and one of those gardens in particular is Fairlane uh, at the estate of the Henry and, Henry and Claire Ford. Um, could you talk a little bit about the history of that? Sure. So um, uh, Claire and Henry Ford, as they were developing their, um, their gardens at, in Dearborn, um, hired a landscape architect by the name of Jens Jensen back in the, around 1913 or so. And um, Jensen was known in particular for his use of native plants. And he told Henry he was gonna um, return the landscape to the way it was when Indians skied down the banks of the Rouge River. And he, uh, most of the garden was like that, but he also um, created some special gardens uh, with, with plants that Clara particularly liked. She liked irises, for instance, roses. And then the, the actual peony garden at Fairlane came a little bit later in the 1920s after, after Jensen had done uh, much of the other work. I think there may have been peonies that were in some other garden spaces, um, but the large peony garden there that, that I forget exactly how many peonies it, it held, but it was in the shape of a large butterfly. And um, uh, it was created by one of Clara's gardeners. Uh, she was a very avid member of many of the garden clubs around the state of Michigan and and often opened up the grounds to uh, uh, various garden clubs to come and visit. And so I think her peony garden was probably very heavily visited through the rest of the 20s, 1930s, 1940s. And then at some point it um, it disappeared and was um, a small replica of it was recreated uh, sometime, I believe in the 1970s or 80s. And are many of the same uh, peony cultivars in that garden at the Nichols Arboretum Peony Garden? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know that we've got a complete record of what was in her original garden, but certainly some of the ones we do know are replicated in our peony garden at Nichols Arboretum. She bought from many of the same growers that had contributed varieties to um, either Dr. Upjohn, um, who uh, donated many of the peonies or uh, some of the ones that were purchased um, from the garden. Another, another garden that I might just mention is that um, um, one of Louisa King in Alma, Michigan, who was an extensive garden writer, and we were really excited to include one of her articles in the book. Um, she was one of the founders of the uh, Women's National Farm and Garden, 
and uh, of which Clara Ford was um, also a member and one of the presidents. And so I'm sure those two women interacted, uh, probably spent time at the, the Peony Garden in uh, both in Fairlane, at Fairlane and Dearborn, as well as in um, uh, Louisa King's Garden in Alma. Something I, else I find very interesting is that um, kind of the history of peony cultivation is not exclusively about professional peony breeders and horticulturists and public gardens, but there's sort of this rich history of um, just amateurs making huge contributions. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the, clearly one of the leading amateur uh, and peony enthusiast was Dr. W.E. Upjohn over um, in Kalamazoo that had a large peony garden at Brook Lodge. And um, uh, he was very meticulous, probably much like his research in pharmaceuticals in terms of keeping records of the peonies that he grew, um, rating each one. And um, I might turn it over to David a little bit to talk about some of some of Dr. Upjohn's favorite peonies and some of his approach there. So Dr. Upjohn, as with Clara Ford, loved irises, but he also loved peonies. And it turned out peonies bloom on his birthday, which is June 5th. And over the years, he acquired a very extensive collection of peonies covering 14 acres. My understanding is there were over 825 different selections of peonies, but most of them are the old fashioned ones, which are very fragrant. And so these are ones that often we think of them as weak stemmed, but they were actually bred to be used as cut flowers. So they were staked as well as the side buds were taken off. Uh, when the side buds were very strong, giving you a beautiful flower for an arrangement. So Dr. Upjohn published a booklet <clears throat> called Brook Lodge Garden, which was his garden peonies, where his 154, 156 favorites out of his 800 some are enumerated with their virtues. And what he particularly liked in them was a good form lots of petals and fragrance. So Duchesse de Nemours is beloved, Festiva Maxima is beloved, and as you go through, he has his own vocabulary. He calls the greatest ones of the old antique peonies old furniture, um, because as with old furniture, you keep them because they are useful, not because they are old. So those are just amongst the few of his many, and we when one can see the peony garden in bloom another season, we actually have a self-guided tour of the peony garden. And in the book, in our book, we also reprint parts of, of his booklet and which are some of his favorites with pictures from our garden. So it's a great treasure trove to explore. Yeah, and one of the cool things is that, that certainly Dr. Upjohn and Clara Ford made their gardens open to the general public. And that, that seems to be a pattern that a lot of the, the big peony enthusiasts um, did open their gardens to the general public. Um, so here in Ann Arbor, for instance, one of the things we found and were able to research as part of the garden, or as far as part of the book, was um, the history of two local growers, Carl Weinberg and um, Andrew Mulig. Um, we had long had a, an Andrew Mulig peony at the, at the um, Arboretum but we didn't know much about it. And in preparing for the book, it gave me excuse to go through a lot of the archives of local papers here in Ann Arbor. And um, Grace Shackman, who's a local historian, alerted us to Carl Weinberg's garden that had been found on the, the west side of Ann Arbor. And, um, and so at the, in the early history of the garden, there were these three gardens all open to the public at one time. And Carl Weinberg was particularly, he was one of these local breeders um, and he was naming his plants for local friends, members of his family. And um, the one that he named Andrew Mulig was one that he entered into a competition of the, I think at the time it was a peony and iris society and it won first prize. And so it, um, by doing this history, it sort of gave us a lot greater understanding of, of that particular peony, um, which we still have at the um, Nichols Arboretum Peony Garden. And um, 
it um, we also sort of found out that that um, how much imp how important peonies were at graduation time at the university, which was um, in June during those early years. And uh, the papers wrote about thousands upon thousands of peonies being in bloom across the city in June. And um, and so it does really have these local roots that extend beyond the this peony garden in specific. But um, like many of these small time breeders, amateur breeders across the country, um, nobody remembers Carl Weinberg as a um, particular breeder or or um, Andrew Mulig is having this this really dynamic garden um, in the early 1920s and 30s. Bob, has the makeup of the Nichols Arboretum Peony Garden stayed the same or has it changed a lot over the years? Well, we, we started um, mm -hmm. at, least, at least during the period that, that I've been director since 1999, um, decided that, that our peony garden was one of our really uh, uh, major collections. And early on, I remember uh, had a friend who was a member of the American Peony Society and asked about all these old varieties we have that were no longer being grown and what we might be doing to uh, protect them. So I, um, I uh, had lunch with Scott Kuntz, who uh, was the founder of Old House Gardens here in Ann Arbor and very interested in preserving historic varieties. And he urged us to think about ways we could back up our peonies at other gardens. And um, so it started a long process of documenting exactly what varieties we historically had in the garden, which ones we still had today. Um, as a result, we ended up creating a peony advisory board of experts from around the country who came in and helped to verify the peonies that we have. Um, David took the lead in, in, in uh, working with the American Peonies or American Public Gardens Association Plant Collections Network. And we got our garden officially listed um, as a historic collection there. And then we began uh, working to really revitalize the space that the peony garden is in. We discovered that um, there always was the intent to create a, a spaces for showing tree peonies. And, and so that's something that we've done in recent years. And we also um, looked at organizing the various peony beds themselves to showcase these historic varieties. We, we set a, a, a date of about 1950 that we were looking to return it back to all pre-1950 varieties, um, recognizing a lot of the originals that uh, Dr. Upjohn gave us. Um, but we also wanted to represent some of the Chinese, um, Japanese, and Korean um, peonies as well. And so that's, that's still a work in progress, finding sources for those, um, but showcasing both these Asian peonies as well as um, the historic North American and European peonies that um, were in the collection from the early days. So to the question of has the garden changed much over the years, I didn't realize till we dug into some of the early publications about it, published by the American Peony Society by Tialdi, who was then director, that it was originally a trial garden. They were trying to establish what were the best peonies. But every, all the peonies were set out in pairs, and I don't even think they got it half filled. There were lots of empty spots in the grid when acquisition stopped. Um, certainly most of them came, many of them came from Dr. Upjohn over time. And then there was a period where no one was really taking great care of it, but at least inventory maps were being made. And the garden tends to fill up, but it's it's clear that plants are being divided rather than anything new brought in. There was a reference in the early literature that it was made to either bloom in a color sequence or a date sequence. But when I look at all the inventory maps, I don't see any evidence of that by how the plants are known to perform. So as it is now, the main beds, other than some rearranging that we'll get to, are basically random, but they're in pairs. The, the early garden, David's mentioning that it was a trial garden. It, the, char 
some of the, the feel of the garden was quite different. It was fenced uh, because in, in certainly in the late twenties and, and early thirties, cars were still driving through the Arboretum and occasionally they would drive through um, other areas. So it was, it was protected behind a fence and only opened for a few hours each day when the peonies were in bloom. So um, it wasn't a space that people normally walk through when they um, went through the Arboretum. And, um, and so that was really quite different historically from the way people perceive it today. Could you both talk a little bit about uh, what you see in the garden's future? Uh, what, what changes might be happening? Well, we continue to, to add historic varieties that are missing. Um, we've, we've narrowed that down to a much, much smaller list. Um, as I mentioned, we've been trying to acquire um, peonies from some of the Asian countries where they were important culturally. So we, we do have herbaceous peonies from the Luoyang International Peony Garden in China, which we acquired some years ago. Uh, we're looking still for sources from China or from Japan and Korea. So we intend to, to add those, and we've been building our, our tree peony collections and um, collection of intersectional peonies. Um, so those are, are some key, key changes, I think. But um, we're also trying to keep the garden the same, too. It's a historic place, and we don't want to make too many changes. About, <clears throat> about half of the peonies and in, in the, the herbaceous peonies in the main grid, as I call it, are cultivars that are not known in any of the other major peony gardens of North America and some in Europe or in any of the commercial nurseries. That is, we, they're basically commercially extinct. And if one thinks of conservation of rare cattle breeds or rare dogs or rare antique uh, ornamentals, to have a collection that is fundamentally half only here and nowhere else in the world is a phenomenal resource with a number of um, ethical responsibilities that come with that. But as Bob's mentioned, we're trying to tell the whole story of peonies in world cultures and their conservation. The, so the tree peonies were on the original inventory maps, just as the word tree peonies, kind of like an early exploration map out of, out of Europe with sea dragons at the edge. But there was no real guidance given, and Dr. Upjohn, as far as we can tell, never had any tree peonies. So we've taken a broader scope of looking at the tree peonies where we want to, where we have Japanese and Chinese traditional forms, ones that were developed in Europe and North America, mostly before 1950, though we've pushed it a little bit. And we have a whole area that are called intersectionals that up. That is, for centuries, people have tried to breed tree peonies with herbaceous peonies and no success. It was done by uh, Mr. Ito in Japan in the era up to and after the Second World War. It, they were only six plants that worked, but he unlocked the secret of how to do it. And so we have a whole set that are all American intersectionals up on the side there because it's mostly Americans doing the intersectional work. They have the color of the tree peonies, which is much, much broader than the herbaceous ones, but they die almost to the ground and they are beautiful. But in the main beds themselves, as Bob has mentioned, it's a conservation collection. We've started working with 11 other peony gardens around the world to see who has what in terms of redundancy so that we can begin to share with each other so that if something were to happen to our garden, such as some new disease were to show up, we wouldn't be so at risk. And one of the great popular white peonies out there, crinkled white, is at every single peony gar institutional garden we can find because it's so beautiful. So as we find some of the rarer ones that we want, something like crinkled white is a candidate to come out because we have others by that breeder, other whites, and this is the, the refocusing that we're doing, as you do with any library collection, where you're working with the rare book room of an era and you're trying to really refine it. Yeah, we've also become aware of the, um, some of the interesting stories of the breeders represented in the garden. And we've done some inventory of like how many of our peonies came from French breeders, how many came from English. 
how many came from there there were a number of women breeders and we we actually want to increase the number of of peonies that come from from those uh those women breeders across both the u.s and elsewhere and so um having a, a more diverse representation of the the background of peony breeders is something that we we hope we can do within the framework we've created of still conserving these historic peonies. 2022 is going to be a, a huge year for the garden as uh, it'll be your centennial. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the plans for 2022? 2022 is exciting. It is going to be the centennial. And so we're planning a, a set of meetings and functions that all center on the weekend of June 5th, which I believe is the Sunday or the Monday. I, I should know that cold and I don't. So that should be in the peak of peony bloom season. We have intentionally not been changing the peony garden in the last two years so that everything there can get some maturity to it because peonies take a little bit of time to grow. And so for 2021, we're also just getting the garden ready so that it is a complete public extravaganza of the peony garden at its peak. And we hope the weather cooperates. We will also be hosting the National Convention of the American Peony Society. That has as one of its components, the largest cut peony exhibit in North America. There will be probably the better part of 600 cut flowers. For that, we're going to host it at the Botanic Garden site and take over the whole building for the workshops and everything else. And we'll have to be shuttling people back and forth. Ann Arbor Farm and Garden is helping us do some of the planning, which COVID-19 has interrupted. But it's going to be a major function with quite the public engagement. So looking forward to it, and as you, indicated in the introduction, we had first thought that Passion for Peonies, the book, would be emerging somewhere in the winter before, I and mean, we're delighted to have it out in advance. One of my favorite parts of the book, and, and kind of uh, going back to something Bob was just talking about, is the story about the individual peony breeders who each sort of brought something unique to peony cultivation. And I hoped you could talk a little bit about some of those stories. Sure, I'll dive in first on this one. One of the th sub themes of the book is the woman who made um, North American peonies. And one of them was a woman named Sarah Please. So we have a short little chapter. She's very enigmatic and hard to find much about her. And although she worked mostly out of Van Wert, Ohio, in adjacent Indiana, the few pieces of archives we can find are in the Whittier, California library, where she seems to have retired um, with relatives or a church community. She did, however, have her peony, when we have one, probably from Dr. Upjohn, called Jubilee. It's one of the most fragrant, largest, um, multi-petaled white peonies you've ever seen. The stems are absolutely too weak to hold it up, but it's sensational. And it placed first in show at the American Peony Society in 1916. And the New York Times covered it, duly noted she was nearly 90 years old, which is totally irrelevant. I just thought that was really. But we're looking for more of her peonies. We have only four of them, I believe, and we're missing some of her signature peonies. But that's just one. Bob probably has some, but I can go on and on about the breeders, because I believe we have 48 different breeders in the inventory, um, and they all have their own history. So, Bob? Yeah, so some of the breeders, um, I mean, there was this real, across the Midwest, um, whole towns got involved in celebrating peony season. So one of the breeders we feature is um, A.M. Brand. We actually reprint one of his booklets about how to grow peonies and, and some of his favorites um, in the book. And um, he, his family had moved from New York State to Faribault, Minnesota. And um, Faribault, um, when you look in the early part of the 20th century, there were postcards that, that showed the peonies in bloom, the warehouse where they sorted their, their plants and sold. And um, uh, the images we were sharing here are from the Faribault Peony Festival, where there were um, uh, 
similar to what we'll be celebrating with the American Peony Society, uh, cut flower shows, um, uh, children getting their pictures taken with peonies, um, beauty pageants associated with the Peony Festival. And um, uh, a lot of that has disappeared. Um, so it is part of the early 20th century celebration of peonies that, that we were really fortunate to be able to record uh, uh, at least the Archie, Archie Mack brand um, story um, together with the some of his writings. Um, and then David, you might want to talk about Sylvia Saunders and the Saunders family. So another fun one in there is a peony called Sylvia Saunders. And her father is, is known as the originator of the modern peonies, the hybrid peonies. But it becomes very clear once you start going through any of the major archives that Sylvia, the only child, is very involved with family business after she has done her college education at Radcliffe and then a, a career in media in New York City. And she comes back and helps run the family nursery and she decides she wants to make the peonies, she needs to make the peonies better known. Certain peony growers know them, but the public doesn't. And the Saunders family and company had a very long lasting relationship with uh, Mr. DuPont of, of Winterthur Garden back east. And in fact, I've been corrected that that relationship actually began in the 1920s, um, at least a decade earlier than I had found in my work with the archives. And Mr. DuPont loved the peony, Saunders peony so much that he had Mr. Saunders and Sylvia design a work to create a peony garden with him and his uh, landscape designer, garden designer, Marion Coffin. And that peony garden still exists. The central peony is one of Dr. Saunders' great peonies called Sylvia Saunders after his garden, excuse me, after his daughter. And we have one of those here in our garden. And the one at Winterthur had disappeared somewhere by the 1960s. So we did a division from our garden to Winterthur. So it's at both. But Sylvia is, was a brilliant marketer. She worked with uh, Mr. DuPont and they did an entire peony cut flower exhibit at the Chelsea Flower Show back um, long ago in an area when airline travel was di very difficult and just the logistics and the expense of getting more than 400 cut peony buds to London in good shape from the US and staging it under time pressures to open uh, was phenomenal. And they got quite the number of awards at the uh, Chelsea Flower Show. So to me, that was a totally unknown um, story. And what's most amusing is when the Peony Advisory Group that Bob had assembled came, uh, Don Hollingsworth, one of the great peony breeders in this country now in his 90s, we asked him what this peony was because we'd lost the name of it. We just had it as an unknown. And he just roared out, well, that's Sylvia Saunders. I haven't seen her in years. And this is why you need experts helping you. Yeah, several of the other experts um, knew of Sylvia Saunders only by description. They'd never seen the flower in bloom. So it was really great to um, be able to showcase that we had it in the garden and have it correctly identified. David, I, I loved earlier when you called the Peony Garden a living museum. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the research that's happening at the garden and, and the importance of that? Sure, and the Sylvia Saunders story is a great segue. Right now, there's so little known about peonies beyond what I will call the superficial appearances that to correctly determine what a peony is requires somebody's visual knowledge in the history. But there were over 4,000 different cultivated selections. Um, and many of them are very similar. So there's a lot of visual confusion. And a colleague of our, Dr. Vlasavas from the Central Botanic Gardens uh, Minsk of the Belarusian Academy of Sciences was here and she said, well, we do molecular passportization of plants. It's basically like um, DNA work about 
who am I and who are my relatives? And she said, let's do what we call passportizing and start working on building a data set that will let us compare peonies that are supposed to be the same. And if they match, we know that they are the same. And if they don't match, at least one of them is wrong. So we've been working with under a MOU with the Central Botanic Garden and Dr. Vlasava is actually here quite a bit, working with Liliana Cortez in EEB Genomics Lab and undergraduate students helping us build this collection here as a reference collection because we know for each of the plants which of the living peony experts has seen it and what they think of it, the likelihood of that identity being correct based on either their knowledge of it or how it was described in the commercial literature when it was published. What's going to be great about this as we build the database, not only here, but in other gardens internationally, as with the DNA, you know, DNA and me sort of thing, we'll be able to work on the unknowns and go, oh, well, that clusters in, with the molecular data of, say, a brand peony, and it fits the description of these three, and then we can start working further. So that's one of the great areas of peony research, and this is uh, <clears throat> the very center of where it's beginning with peonies. You mentioned um, undergraduate work, and it sounded like you were mostly referencing people in uh, biology and other sciences, but are students able to get involved in the peony garden from other departments at the university? Yeah, for instance, we're working with a, uh, a professor in engineering who has a rather interesting project of, of um, trying to process human urine into fertilizer that can be applied. And um, she she likes to talk about uh, describing part of her project as pee on the pee, pee on the peonies. And um, so we're looking into um, whether or not some of the that fertilizer could be used on some of the peonies that are seem to be deficient in some minerals. And last summer we had a, a an undergraduate student who's working in her lab work with us all summer and um, you know, exploring how we might be able to use some of that fertilizer on a test basis in some of our, um, not only the peony, peony garden, but also sort of some of our other garden spaces as well. And we, we routinely have um, summer interns, and typically the last few years we've had um, undergraduate students helping care for the peony garden over the course of the summer. And um, sometimes they're they're researching and stories that they're creating interpretive materials as well as helping care for the plants. And I would also like to be working with faculty and students in a number of disciplines. One is in terms of gendered cultural spaces because the historic peonies were bred to be cut flowers used indoors, seen indoors. So the colors had to do with how they were seen in either a domestic landscape, such as a, a formal dining room um, or a church setting or a municipal hall, but it was probably a group of women or the homeowner deciding what was being done. And I'd like to understand the social dynamics of what drove the floral forms and the colors. This is not just some arbitrary thing of it's pretty. There's a context for it. And likewise, Bob and I would both love to see more students in art, dance, performance, and the like and how they might be inspired. That's great. Well, I hoped we could kind of wrap up um, with a, a short discussion of why do you both think people are so passionate about peonies? What, what, what kind of explains the fascination and love that seems to pass from generation to generation for this plant? Well, that's a, I mean, it's certainly a very easy plant to grow. Um, you plant the bulbs and basically forget, or plant the, the root pieces and, and basically forget about it. And the next year it reliably comes up. Um, peonies can, can live for centuries. They, um, people think they have to be divided, but they don't really have to be. They can just keep blooming year from year to year. And, um, and then there's such vibrant colors. I mean, the, the peony garden at Nichols Arboretum, when it's in full bloom, people are just are astounded when they come in and see this tremendous display of color. And then you also have the fragrance that, that um, 
Uh, and I know a lot of psychologists and others sort of think that fragrance is one of the things that triggers memories um, so much. So I think, you know, that kind of vibrancy and, and reliability is certainly one of the things that, that makes people so enchanted with peonies. We've all had grandparents or aunts and uncles talk to us about choosing a life partner. And peonies fit many of the characteristics. They're very dependable. They're very reliable. They're not demanding. They're rewarding. They're beautiful. And what's, what's the problem? <laughs> so putting it in that context, it also puts it in terms of people like and appreciate constancy through life. And peonies are one of the touchstones. All kinds of things can be going on. COVID-19 can be going on. Um, wars can be going on and the peonies will bloom, um, which is why they're so important in so many cultures. Our current culture is fixated on ephemerality. Um, excuse me, it's our, our current culture is fixated on something just keeping going, what I call plastic flowers, annuals that bloom all the time, roses that bloom all the time, uh, lawns that are green and just stay that way. But peonies are all about a time and a place and a moment. And that's part of what makes them so special. They're very much focusing you on being right here, right now, and nothing else. And there's great sanity in that. Right. So if you miss a bloom, you have to wait a whole year till it comes back again. Well, I have to say, neither of you brought up the reason I love peonies, and that's because they attract so many ants, which I, I love watching them scurry around. So what, what explains that? Why, why are ants passionate about peonies? Well, I mean, for some people, that, that's one reason some people don't like to grow peonies, because they have ants or they... They have cut peony flowers and brought them inside and brought the ants along with them. So um, uh, ants, ants are attracted to peonies. They're, they're one of the defenders of the plant and that they actually, um, the, the flower buds have nectaries that produce uh, sugar and it attracts ants. Um, the, the legend is that, that, that ants help to open the flowers, which isn't true at all. Um, but the, the fact that the peonies are attracting the ants helps to defend peonies against other insects. Um, and um, there are certainly tricks you can do to try to um, shake the peonies or the ants off the peonies. And maybe, maybe I'll let David describe a little more about the ants. Sure. As Bob is presenting, it's exactly right. Here in the temperate zone, we don't see something that's common in the tropics, which is called extra floral nectaries, which is botanical English for places just on the flower bud on the outside that put out nectar. We think of nectar bringing in the hummingbirds and the butterflies and the moths and the bees, but the extra floral nectaries secrete the nectar before the bud opens. And it does exactly what we see. It brings the ants in. And so the way I like to think of the ants is basically they're the hired organized crime group out of the insect world that are doing, and the nectar is the protection money. So the ants are going to come, they're going to walk around, any caterpillars, those will get hauled off for food back for the ant colony. Anything lands there. I mean, you look at peonies, you don't see much damage, do you? But the ants aren't bothering any of the insects that come to the wild forms that actually open up and have pollen and nectar. And so, as Bob was saying, that's a defense mechanism. If you don't like the ants, just cut the flower off, hold it upside down, and just flick the stem, and the ants will go flinging off. I was amused at one garden club talk. I've probably given 45 or 50 now across the Midwest. One person told me, in all seriousness, that she could not have peonies in her garden because her husband hated ants, and the peonies would bring ants to the property. And I really didn't know where to begin because the ants are already on her property and yours and mine. It's just that the peonies, she would notice them. Um, so it isn't as if all of a sudden they're going to come in, 
as if you throw bundles of hundred dollar bills around and expect you know not to have organized crime show up. Um, <laughs> it's just how visible. So I hope that's an amusing way of thinking about it. I love the peonies. In past peony functions at the Arboretum, we've had a, a bingo game for kids to play of can you find them, and the free cell in the middle has always been the ants. So when we, when we did the book, we certainly had to have ants in the book, and people who read the book will see that ants are marching through all the pages. Well, thank you both so much for this great conversation. Um, I, I think the book is just wonderful and beautiful, and I, I'm, I'm so pleased with how it all turned out. Um, maybe, Bob, could you talk for just a second about where people can get their hands on it? Sure. Um, right now, the best place to buy the book is directly from the University of Michigan Press, uh, which offers it at a discount if you go online to order it and can have it shipped directly to your, your house. Um, it, it also should be carried by a number of regional bookstores in the area. Um, we hope that other uh, botanic gardens and Arboretum will be carrying it, especially some of the, the ones that are featured in the book as well. We know that they're planning to carry it in their gift shops. Our own gift shop here at Mathai Botanic Gardens and Nichols Arboretum will also be carrying the book. It's not currently open. We hope to open later this summer. Um, or we may actually come up with a way of, of being able to sell it online. Um, but probably the most reliable way to get a hand on, get your hands on the book is to order it directly from University of Michigan Press. Terrific. Thank you both so much. Well, thank you, Scott. And thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for hosting us today. Yes, and enjoy peonies and next spring and beyond.